Okay, the whole idea of taking a picture is haram according to the majority of them. Let's say there's a slight min minority who allowed it. Those who allow it, when was the last time one of them posed? So you get these, these people saying, I'm on this and I'm part of this clan, and he's posing with, you know, with all kinds. No, Habibi. Now this here is a title. And I hate to tell you, but I have to tell you, you're not living up, you're not living up to the, the way of these people. Now, we all have our shortcomings. But there are things which we can control and there are things which we cannot control. You can control not taking a picture of yourself. Believe me. You can do it. It's very easy. And you can do it. You don't have to upload a picture of yourself. That's very easy. Yeah, we may not be able to do many other things after struggling, but I don't think you need to struggle to stop yourself from taking a picture of yourself and uploading on Facebook. No, Habibi. It's not that easy, brothers. Seriously, wallah, it's not that easy. It's not something that you will learn within five minutes. It's not, okay, la ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah, oh, mashallah. Okay, I'm, I'm one of this, one of these groups. You will see why. When we go into the actual characteristics of them, you will see what we have to learn and how much we have to do until we reach that particular point. طيب. Then, uh, this is what Allah said about them. The Prophet وسلم, said about them, Hadith al-Bukhari Muslim, Hadith al Mas'ud, nas qarni thumma alladheena yalunahum <laughs> the best of mankind. The best of mankind after the prophets. My generation is my generation, then those who follow them, then those who follow them. This is the summary, this is the crux of the whole matter. If we understood this correctly, all of our issues will be resolved bi If we understand that the best people are the Sahaba, and the Tabi'een and Atba'a Tabi'een. So we live Islam and understand it and apply it per their understanding. Then we have started to travel upon the path, the path of that one group. Until then, no. And I will give you a, a, a practical example that happened to me this morning. One of the brothers who belong, maybe he belongs to one of these sects, anyways, he follows the Hanafi Madhab blindly. Mashi, we're not saying that those who follow the Hanafi Madhab are not part of this path, but that's a, a sign of danger. He comes to the masjid every morning, and he prays four rak'at. So, as I told you before, the masjid is the place for Amr bil Ma'roof wa Na'al Munkar. You don't be quiet, you have to speak. Sadi Akhi Barakallah I noticed that you pray four rak'at. You don't assume, just so you won't wrong him, what are you praying? I know what he's praying. I know he's praying Tahir al Masjid. Then the Sunnah of Fajr. But I don't say that because I may be wrong. He said, no, that's not what I'm doing. So I said, what are you praying? He said, Tahiyyat al-Masjid. Then Sunnah al-Fajr. I said, listen, Akhi. Tahiyyat al-Masjid is a Salah which is done when there's nothing else to pray. Yani if you come into the Masjid and there's nothing else for you to do, there's no Salah for you to pray, then you don't sit down until you pray. And we call that two rak'at Tahiyyat al-Masjid. If there's another intention, if you want to pray the Sunnah of Fajr or the Sunnah of Dhuhr or the Sunnah of Maghrib or whatever, then you no longer have the Sunnah of Maghrib, as because you know, that's after Maghrib, any other Sunnah, then you no longer have to pray Tahiyyat al Masjid. You don't even have that intention anymore. Tahiyyat al Masjid is dropped because the whole idea is that don't sit down until you pray. And if you pray the Sunnah of Fajr, you've done your job. So the brother said, No. Why are you saying that? I said, because this is a time of prohibition of Salah. And the only thing the Prophet ﷺ did, he prayed the Turaqa'at of Fajr. So you can't pray more than that. The Sahaba didn't pray more than that. You have to stick to that. The whole idea of the Hayat al-Masjid is not. Now, it didn't get pretty, it got ugly. And one of, the, one of the ways of the people of desires is what? Turning the tables around. When he, was, when he wasn't able to answer me, he said, yeah, where's your cap? I'm wearing a cap now. I wasn't wearing one in the masjid. I said, what does the cap have to do with this? He said, you're saying sunnah, sunnah. What sunnah are you telling me not to do? Where's your cap? Isn't the cap sunnah? I said, listen, we don't want to now shift the issue. Because we can shift it and I can prove to you that it's not a sunnah. Where are your leather sandals like that of the Prophet Sallallahu Where are they? And what is this you wear? Why aren't you wearing it like the Messenger of Allah? Did he wear a white coat like this with these buttons? And he wasn't able to answer. Then he said, of course, when he, we reached this dead end, he said, leave me alone. Now listen, I'm just trying to teach you something. He came this morning, 
He prayed six rakat. Allah al-Azim. Wallahi. I'm sitting there like, man, this brother, man, really wants to start trouble with me, Akhi. You know, I don't know what's up with these people, man. But anyways, that's life. Six rakat. I wonder where the other two came from, but I didn't. I was going to be quiet. I said, you know what? It's going to cause fitna in the masjid. Because sometimes if, enjoy, if forbidden the evil will create more evil, you zip it. As soon as he finished, he spoke to me. Salam alaikum, alaikum salam. I try to be nice and barakallah feek. Good to see you again. Uh, he said, you told me yesterday about the hate al masjid. He said, yet. And he made me explain to him the whole thing again. He said, yeah. He pulled out a piece of paper from his, from his pocket. He said, this hadith in Bukhari Sharif. Bukhari Sharif, beautiful. Bukhari, no problem with me. He said, the hadith says that between every, and he wrote it in Arabic, with the tashkil, with the fatha dhamma kasra. Two narrations. He said, the hadith says, between every adhan and iqama, there are two rak'at. I said, okay. He said, so, what's wrong with, why are you stopping me? The hadith says that I can pray two rak'at between adhan and iqama. I said, Akhi, what does that have to do with our issue? Tayyib, no problem between every adhan and iqama. You can pray two rak'at. He said, so I'm praying tahiyyat al-masjid. Meaning the hadith says you can pray. It doesn't take rak'at. Actually, it says pray. There's a prayer. He said, that means I can pray. I said, Habibi, you cannot bring one hadith from Bukhari without looking into other textual evidences and apply it according to your understanding. This is not the way of the people of that one path, by the way. You cannot just read Hadith al-Bukhari, khalas. Brother, I said, this is Aam, this is general. And you must look into other specifying narrations. A Hadith khasa. To khasa al Hadith. We went back and forth, dead end. Then I remember by Allah's grace, these new technology, which I hope that you use it for da'wah and not for entertainment. The whole Islamic library is here. And I have uh, uh, books of Hanafi fiqh. Hanafi fiqh. I went into the book of the Ahnaf, into the book of fiqh al-ibadat, for some person called uh, Hajj, uh, something in Hanbali, or uh, Hanbali, something along these lines. And I put Rata'atay al-Fajr. And it says, among the times when it is disliked to pray, and they quoted Fajr, and there's a hadith from the Prophet ﷺ says, La salah, there's no salah after, after the time of Fajr except Rak'atayn Fajr. And he was like dumbfounded, like, <gasps> I said, Akhi, see here it says, Al fiqh al Hanafi. I know he's a Hanafi. Al fiqh al Hanafi. This is your scholars. And this is the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ telling you, don't pray anything after Fajr comes in except the two rak'ah of Fajr. And the conversation ended. What is the point? The point is that the people who, or who go on that path don't use this methodology. I don't go searching for one hadith in Bukhari Muslim and say, no, I will apply it in this fashion according to my desires because I understand. No. How did the Sahaba understand it? And what did the Prophet ﷺ really say? And are there other narrations which further explain it? After we get all this investigation out of the way, and we have clarity upon the Sunnah, then and only then I act upon the Sunnah. I don't follow desires. You see the difference? This is the quality of the people of that path. They, are, they, they must refer to the khayrun nas, to the best of generations. The best of people they must because they understood these narrations, they conveyed them to us. If the Sahaba never prayed, more than two rak'at between the Adhan of Fajr and the Iqama, then you don't pray any more than that. Because you're not better than them, and you sure don't understand the deen better than they did. Clear? Beautiful. That was Alhamdulillah. Allah decrees that these things happen before the lectures, so they can be integrated with the event, so you won't think I'm crazy. Tayyip, their characteristics. <coughs> what are the characteristics of Ahl sunnah wal Jama'ah, al firqa al-Najiyah, wa ta'if al-Mansura, Atba'u salaf al-salih, ahlul hadith, the people of hadith. And I'm not naming, I'm not naming groups. I'm speaking about their way. The people of hadith are those who follow the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ before anything and anyone. We will see further, inshallah ta'ala. The first characteristic is that they hate sectarianism. They hate division. They hate that the Muslims are not united under one slogan of the correct understanding of La ilaha illallah Muhammadun Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They don't like it. 
And the reason why they don't like it, because Allah doesn't like it. And the way of the people of that one path is that anything which Allah loves, they love, and anything which Allah hates, they hate. And Allah said in the Quran, وَلَا تَكُونُوا كَالَّذِينَ تَفَرَّقُوا وَاخْتَلَفُوا مِنْ بَعْدِ مَا جَاءَهُمُ الْبَيِّنَاتِ وَأُولَٰئِكَ لَهُمْ عَذَابٌ عَظِيمٌ And do not be like those who تَفَرَّقُوا They divided. وَاخْتَلَفُوا Then they differ. After the clear proofs came, came to them. After the clear proofs came to them. And for those there's a great punishment. Don't be like them. Don't divide. Don't separate. Don't differ amongst each other after the truth has come to you. Once the truth comes, all of you must unite upon it. Allah said, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ فَرَّقُوا دِينَهُمْ وَكَانُوا شِيَعًا لَسْتَ مِنْهُمْ فِي شَيْءٍ Verily, those who divide their religion and they became Shia, sect and groups, لَسْتَ مِنْهُمْ فِي شَيْءٍ You have nothing to do with them. You are not part of them. This is Allah telling the Prophet ﷺ, you have nothing to do with these people, fi shayt, in anything. You have absolutely nothing to do with them. Who? Those who divide their groups and they became Shia. In the ayah, kullu hizbin bima ladayhim farihun. Every group happy and content with what they have. This is our book. This is our tariqah. This is our way of da'wah. This is the, the name of our organization. These are the names of blah, blah, blah. Khalas. Anything outside this is wrong. Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah said in commenting on this ayah, said in, the, in the commenting in, the, in his book Al-Fatawa, anyone who puts up an individual, regardless of who, the, who this individual is, if you take him up as the ultimate person, like in the Ahnaf, Al-Imam Al-A'zam, Imam Abu Hanifa, then you, you love people or you have enmity against them, depending on this person. For this person, then he is among those whom Allah said about Farraqudinahum wa kanu Shia. He's among those who have divided their religion and they became sects. If you take one individual and your enmity and love with the Muslims is based on him, whatever he says, whatever he does, only no one else. And he said, as for those who have fiqh for the men who have fiqh and learned the deen from the people of knowledge then it is not right for them to set up their scholars, or yeah, to set up an individual, and, and then they make, the, they make them the standard on which they uh, affiliate with people or they boycott them. This is also part of dividing the deen. So we're not attached to fulan, sheikh, one sheikh. Like you find the people of the tasawwuf and others, they have one sheikh. And his sheikh took it from another, you know, tariqa and from another sheikh, it's like inheritance. No, ahl sunnah wal jama'ah, we have ulama. And we're not confined to the living ones, we go all the way back to the first ones. From the sahaba, tabi'een, atba'u tabi'een, then the ulama of the ummah for the four madahib, and Bukhari, Muslim, Tirmidhi, and so on and so forth. We're not confined to an individual where our whole religion is based on him. They don't like sectarianism. In the hadith of Hudayfa, the famous hadith of Hudayfa, he said the people used to ask the Messenger of Allah about good. And I used to ask him about evil because I was afraid that I would come across it. So he asked him, uh, 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 will there be good after this evil? Then he said, will there be an evil after this good? And so on and so forth. Until he made it to the hadith where he said, will there be any evil after the goodness which the Prophet ﷺ spoke about? He said, naam. Prophet Prophet told them about the things that will happen in this ummah, they will be du'at. People, propagators, standing at the doorsteps of Jahannam. Whoever responds to them, they will toss them and cast them in Jahannam. The Prophet said, there will come a time where people will call you Jahannam. Come follow our way, come follow our deviated, invented, innovated way. Come join our sect and our group. They're calling people to Jahannam. Then